Chris, my favorite word in Anishinaabe Moan since I was a little girl, and this is probably super weird and nerdy, is my name. Wabin and Nongokwe. Maybe. Morning Star Woman. So Wabin is morning, Nongo is star, and then Kwe. Wabin and Nongokwe. And I think for me, the language was lost when, they, when my grandmother went to the residential schools and she never spoke it. I don't have it and I want it so bad, so I really want to get going and meet my language. Yeah, of course. I totally feel the same. You know, even though I grew up with language all around me, being a fluent speaker has always been a dream of mine. Well, we need to revitalize it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to, to get the children speaking again. We need to get us, the older people, speaking again. I mean, I think that's the only way to make the changes, to get our stories back, to get our language back, to get our spirit back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be, I think, really important. We have to know ourselves uh, in the language. You have to be able to think in the language, dream in the language. That's my goal. I want to be able to dream in my own language. That's an incredible like, thought. All of this, I want this to be my mind, my brain. This is what I need in my head. Here it is. Our spirit surrounds us. My name is Chris Nargang. I am an archaeologist and artist. My grandmother was a residential school survivor who hid her true identity from our family. I am on this journey to find my truth, reconcile the past, and continue the legacy that was stolen from her. Way. I'm Anishinaabe from Batuana First Nation, and I belong to the Three Fires Medewin Medicine Society. The movement of Indigenous knowledge revitalization is thriving across Turtle Island, and I want to introduce Chris and all of you to the revolutionary work being done by those who have dedicated their lives to shifting colonial narratives by harnessing Indigenous knowledge. Way, way, uh, way, uh, way, way, uh, way, uh, way uh. We are, we are the, the future, future our, our ancestors, ancestors dreamed, dreamed of. of. Our prophecies tell us that the time is now to reclaim, rematriate, and revitalize the knowledge intended for us. This, this is, is Future, future History. history. So Gabe DeRose is a professor at the University of Minnesota, Morris. He is a fluent speaker and he actually had to come up with an entire curriculum um, and model to teach the language because all of his knowledge of Anishinaabe Moan was passed down to him um, orally, the way that it was passed down traditionally for thousands of years. What I'm realizing is that we, uh, we need to revitalize the language to preserve our culture. Without it, I don't know if we can come back that easily. I'm sure we're going to hear all kinds of indigenous wisdom, but from the perspective of our Anishinaabe Moan, yes. the true language. <laughs> oh, oh, bonjour. Bonjour. Hi, I'm Serene. Oh, I'm Chris. Oh, Pleasure to meet you. Thanks for having us. Indigo. Oh, bonjour. Skogonio Nindigo. Wazaganev Nindigo. Makobanes Nindigo. Makwando Tem. Me Tigani Nwanjiban. Shkwanyaganes. Shigo. Niwitabachim uh, language revitalization. My English name is Red Eagle. Uh, that was a name given to me by my grandfather. I am a professor at the University of Minnesota Morris, and uh, I've been teaching there the last seven years. Uh, our language is uh, sacred, for one thing. It's our first language. We call that Kitinwe uh, Weninan, the way we sound. And the way I win is the way you sound. And that sound was given by the Creator. The Creator gave us this really sacred language that really defines us who we are as Anishinaabe people. And one of the important things about that is that if we lose our language, we lose the identity of who we are. You know, a lot of our uh, Native brothers and sisters, you know, across North America are are losing the language, and a lot of them, of course, have lost the language. They want to reclaim something that's lost within them. Indigenous people who are seeking 
and who are in positions where they don't have no assistance or help. I think one of the things that they could do is that they can approach their local elders and give them a sema, which is tobacco, and ask for uh, guidance, ask, ask for some leadership, who they can approach in terms of the language. But one of the things that, uh, that comes to mind is that when you try to learn the language, you have to pray. You always have to remember to, to have that spirituality and to have that tobacco wasema and that you, you put it down and you ask the Creator to give you guidance and help you with this language. Because bottom line, Anishinaabe people are spiritually based. And when you pray in that language in a good way, a good heart, mind and soul, the spirits will acknowledge that. This is First Nations House at the University of Toronto. Well, we're here to meet Susan Blight. She's Anishinaabe from Kuchiching First Nation. She is a visual artist, she's a filmmaker, she's an arts educator, and she's very dedicated to the Ojibwe language. She's also one of the co-founders of Ogima Mikana, which is a project that seeks to restore Anishinaabe Moen to place names on the streets of Gaget Kiwaning, which is Toronto. Susan Blight and Dijinakaz, Shaganashi Winakazo Young, Kuchiching and Donji, Nibejigo Medeo. My English name is Susan Blight. I'm Snapping Turtle Clan Anishinaabe from Kuchiching First Nation, which is in Treaty 3. I'm a first degree Medewin woman, and I now live in Toronto and I work at the University of Toronto. And you're working to revitalize Anishinaabe Moen and language. Where did that begin? Four years ago, my grandfather passed on to the spirit world. And so my grandfather <clears throat> was the last person in our family who spoke the language fluently. Mm -hmm. And when he passed on, I went into a really deep grief. But amongst that grief was this sense of urgency because he was the last person who could speak fluently. It was something that I could do that would honor him and would maintain sort of a piece of him within me. So there was that. Um, the other thing is that in May of 2015, I initiated into Medewin. So in our lodge, they speak a lot of Anishinaabe Moen. They really kind of frown on English. So I, I want to get to a point where it doesn't need to be translated to me. So those two things are really how my, my what I call a love affair with Anishinaabe Moen happened. For Hayden and I, when we started the Yogi Mamikana project, we were interested in indigenous rights and resistance against the settler colonial system, but we wanted to find some way to center the language as something that also needs to be fought for. And you rename and reclaim. And for me to actually see the Anishinaabe language, it's very it's moving. How did you get there? Like, is, did they just offer you, do you want to put up some signs? Or? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no I, <laughs> Ogima Mikana is an activist collective works outside of state recognition. So we do not ask for permission to do the actions that we do. We position it under the umbrella of sort of interventionist art. And so we basically go in and we make our own signs and we just put them up. There's a couple of reasons we do that. One is the revitalization of the language. The other is representation to reach out to other Anishinaabe and let them know we're here, we are in cities, we move through cities, that we have the right to be on the land, whether it's in the city or in the bush, we have the right to be here. And But it's not just about representations. It goes beyond representation to an actual deep belief that our ways are valid, that our language is valid, and that we have the right to assert that. Mm. So these are kind of the tools of what we do. Uh, we have a lot of art supplies and a lot of Anishinaabe dictionaries. Because <laughs> um, neither of us are fluent speakers, it takes a lot of research. We'll pick a location and decide on a name, a translation. Sometimes it's a direct translation. We did College Street, for instance, um, and we uh, translated it, I believe, to Gikenda Wagamik, uh, Place of Knowledge. 
that's a, sort of a literal translation. Uh, whereas uh, Spadina Avenue is actually an anglicization of Anishinaabe Mawin. And we went back to the original, which is Ishpadana, which is a verb for being on a high hill. So if you look from the lake and you look up Spadina, you'll see that it goes up, right? The Anishinaabe were here, they were camped here, and they called it Ishpadana. The settler colonial system has done such a good job of, of invalidating us. To varying degrees, I think we've all been affected by that idea that our ways are lesser. From here up to my shoulders. Okay. Uh, ready? One, ready? two, three, go. go. <laughs> we did it! All right. It's so powerful to get to a place where you believe and understand innately that our ways are good. We're going to be here. We have a future. I'm talking about language revitalization. I think it is a very important issue, not only for the Anishinaabek Nation, but all nations across Canada and the United States. My name is Marta Kayak. I'm from Pond Inlet, Nunavut, but living in Ottawa for the last seven years. And I teach Inuktitut and Inuit history in Nunavut Sivuniksavut, and I prefer to speak in Inuktitut. I'm more comfortable in Inuktitut. It's part of my history, it's part of my culture, it's part of us. We need this to help build a stronger nation. With the residential school and things such as the 60s scoop, this has been detrimental to our communities, causing a famine of addictions and poverty. With language, we would have a better sense of who we truly are. A lot of things that we describe and use, you can't find anything to match that in English. For me, Inuktitut is so important. And for the other indigenous people around the world, their language is so important. My grandmother, she would always tell me, Kina Abdek Gwa Widok Dadaman. And then our language of Ojibwe, that means we all must help each other. We're here in Wata First Nation and we're going to meet Ryan DeCare who has not only reclaimed his language for himself but now has brought it back to the community and is working with other language speakers to revitalize the language. Sego. 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 <laughs> Chris Nargang. Nice to meet you. Ryan Decare, Thanks nice for having us. Nice Welcome to Walk the Mall. Thank territory. you. Okay. Yeah, so you guys came out here on a really on a perfect day. Awesome. Yeah. So how do you work your garden into your language? Well, language and our connection to our land, which is our garden, it's been in our traditions for as long as we know. They're one and the same, right? When the way that we speak our language is a reflection of how uh, we relate to our natural environment and how we relate to our people. So when we engage with the garden, we're really connecting to uh, what makes us who we are. And when we also encourage our people when they're here to use the language. So you look up there, there's signs of all um, those crop names. We're disconnected from our food system. We're disconnected from our language. So we're really trying to connect, uh, hit two birds with one stone here. Our people love potatoes, so we got lots of potatoes, 10 rows of potatoes, all different varieties of potatoes. We call those ohananata. 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 Good one. Ohananata. 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 While I was growing up, like many of us, uh, we always feel that something is missing. If uh, anything's going to change with regards to that, somebody's got to get the work done. And I took it upon myself to do my best to become a proficient Kanyakeha, a Mohawk speaker. We got beats here, and we call those Onegwa Tera Nigadzi Kota. That's a long one. Onegwa Tera. Onegwa Tera. Nigadzi Kota. 
Nigazi Koda. Pizza means red root. Red root. Yeah, or yeah, a red, a red, like a fist or any ball like that shape. Oh, so like a yeah. bulb. A yeah, a bulb. bulb. Yeah, that's yeah, what it means. Okay. Yeah. It must be quite daunting for people when they first start. Like, oh my goodness. I just like. Well, especially because our our language, like um, Nishinaabe Mu, and like any most languages in Canada of indigenous languages, they're all verb based, right? Mm -hmm. And. Anything you see, like we're talking about in these gardens, they talk about, we're talking about what they do or their quality, you know, and that's beautiful, in my opinion, yeah. because it talks about their responsibility or how we really understand their relationship in their natural environment. Our language tells us a lot about our connection to land. When we're in with our hands in the dirt, that's when we really feel it, you know. And you can also see they're having so much fun. They're, everybody's talking and laughing. And well, that's the and other piece, that's right? The part, right? That's the important thing. It's nice to contribute to this idea of food sovereignty and to be growing good food for your people. But at the end of the day, it's also about that, right? People yeah. chatting and joking and having yeah. fun. <laughs> my grandpa John must have been a Viking. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Come on in. Oh, it's nice yeah. and cool in here. Yeah, is it ever, huh? So yeah, I'll just introduce to you uh, some of the people from the community and my family and my loved ones and everybody who supports me in all the work that I do. Okay, so awesome. have a seat over here, find a spot. Yeah. You know? I think uh, Grace and Dennis are the great speakers. Wouldn't you agree, Ryan? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Particularly, yeah. Uh, mm. I try. <laughs> We're always hardest on ourselves, right? So I'm sure they'll have something else to say about your language. <laughs> and that, but, like, please end it now. Yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so as to the two great speakers, how did you keep your language so strong? Well, I was away since I was about 17, 18. And I came back 15 years ago. And they were having longhouse meetings here, and I drove over here. There was somebody parked, with a man across from me parked. And as I was getting out, and he was talking to me in Mohawk, and I said to myself, I understand it. After being away for it for so long, you don't forget it. Because that was our first, you know, my first language. And I hadn't spoken it to say even a, a couple of sentences in about 70 years, 70, 80 years. Oh, I'm telling my age. <laughs> you said 20, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Do got Nikita Wakla is very, very fortunate to have Ryan and his youth and his leadership he's shown in this community to uh, try to revitalize the language. I think we're very, very fortunate here to have him here. And we need um, more young leaders like Ryan to help. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah, cool. What have you noticed in your own life since you learned the language? What has changed for you the most? It's really connected me to my people and my community. You know, I have a sense of responsibility now to my community because I have some knowledge that I need to pass on to them. And that the fact that I have that, I feel that I need to give it away in the best ways I can. Awesome. Cool.
the other vehicle. <laughs> okay. One of the most important things we've learned in language is that we need to restore it. It needs to come back. It's beautiful to hear you speak it, and I'm so sad to know that I can't. So I really have to make an effort, after all the great people we've met, to try and reclaim my language for myself and for my children. I think it's an obligation that we all need to make for our communities. I want to say chimigwitch to all of the people, the young people, the elders out there who are working to not only hold on to the language but revitalize. Every plant here means that there will be a child who will speak the language in this community. So I say chimigwitch. Chimigwitch. Nikonis, Nikon.